Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that, he turned aside to God. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take off your sand take the sandals off your feet, for this place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And later Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Having personally never been in combat or in the military of, of any sort, I can't speak of, to the motivation of why someone would want to enter into the military. Not, I'm not saying that it's a bad idea. I'm saying I've never been there. I don't know what, exactly what motivates. And I think if you've never been there, you probably shouldn't speculate. But I speculate that there's two reasons, and I believe that they are in, and John, you can correct me, I believe that they're in the swearing, God and country. However, in our society, that first one, because of the second one, the first one has gotten very confused for God and country. But because when we ask, what God? I don't think that we get a very good answer. I don't think anyone can answer it. If you pull out money from your pocket and it says, in God we trust on it, the first thing you should ask is, which God? What God? The idea behind putting in God we trust on their money was to remind people that when they were paying for something, that they don't put their trust in the money. They put their trust in God. That's the whole reason it's on there. Did you know that? It's not, it's not a civil statement to say the country trusts in God. It's meant to be a reminder to the person who's paying to not trust in money, but trust in God. Again, though, which God? There are many gods. We call them false gods and idols. And many of them have names. And so while people desire to put, to keep in God we trust on money and in uh, on our license plate and things like that, I, I suppose I'm for it. I just wish we could be a little more specific. Christ died for you. I like that one a lot. In Christ we trust. But perhaps that's the problem. In when you're writing, well, I'll put it this way, there's an old writer's trick when you're writing a novel that's called the everyman. Now the everyman when you're writing means that you leave that person as undescript as possible. And the reason for that is so that you can see yourself in that person and that it can be male or female what, who, whoever the person reading is that's they can put themselves into that character and so they leave him basically like a blank page and you the reader get to color in what he looks like and 9.99 percent of 10 it'll look just like you 
Because who who's going to put somebody else in an adventure? Well, that's also what we can do with the word God. The word God is simply, is simply the every man. And whoever is reading it can paint the God, whoever they want, into every man, into the story. Because God, just the word God, is not enough. It's not enough of a descriptor for us anymore. And so, when military men go into war zones and, and go in to do their jobs, I can promise you that the God in which they love is not ambiguous. Kind of like the whole idea that there's no atheists in foxholes. You don't go out and risk your life saying, well, there's a God. I don't know who he is. No, there, I know, I know from, in my family alone, there have been a lot of military Bibles, crosses, etc. that has been handed down that, that my family has taken into war with them. It was not ambiguous. And when your life is on the line, very few things are. It's only when we're, when we're not in danger that we have the freedom to speculate and to think and to say, well, maybe evolution is right. Maybe there's more than one way to heaven. Maybe, etc. But when it comes to it, we have to make a good confession. And so when Moses, this poor fellow, he comes and he sees a bush that is burning but is not being consumed. I remind you of the snakes that were on fire. Not that there's anything on a snake that should be able to burn, but still they were on fire not being consumed. Likewise, this bush was on fire but was not being consumed. And so Moses, like anyone, goes to see why this bush is on fire and not being consumed. And so the Lord says to him, he says, Moses, Moses. And, he, and Moses says to him, here I am. Then he says, do not come near. Take, off, take your sandals off your feet. For the place in which you are standing is holy ground. I think that's also something that we've lost. To, to a large extent. Why was the ground holy? What was it that made that ground holy? And should, have, should Moses have known it? I don't know if Moses should have known it or not. And I assume that, that he didn't, or he shouldn't have, because nothing had happened yet except for the fire. But what made the ground holy was simply because God said that it was. He spoke and it became that way. So that tells us that anywhere that God's word is spoken, that place is holy. And so this place is holy. I am not recommending, particularly the men, that you should take off your shoes right now. But you understand the idea. We are in a holy place. In the presence of God because his word is given here and so you are in a holy place and so I recommend for anyone rather than taking off your shoes circumcise your minds let everything be cut away all malice all anger all sin let it be cut away because you are standing on holy ground and if Moses if Moses was offensive with his shoes, imagine how offensive we are with our hearts. We enter into God's house and we take God's house for granted. We take the pastor for granted. We take the altar guild for granted, the LWML for granted, every, every one, the treasurers for granted, the treasurer for granted. The deacons, for granted, that's the one I was going to say. 
We take, we take even this building for granted. We take, and, and, and we shouldn't be surprised at that, because we also take for granted our family and our friends, those around us, and the reason is because these things become commonplace to us over time. It's sort of like when you have when something is taken away, you don't really realize how much you relied on it. For ex I remember, uh, for example, when I had my foot surgery, I didn't realize how much I relied on my right foot. I, I, re I realized that I relied on it, but I didn't realize how much until it was taken away. Well, that's the same way that it is with families. If someone loses a spouse, you, don't, you realize that you had been taking them for granted and that you don't, you, don't, you don't realize how much you relied on them until they're gone. And that's just human nature. It is human nature to take things for granted. Well, Likewise, when we see things in here and we, and we see one another, our friends and our families, when we take each other for granted, when we hurt each other, truly we're not realizing how much we rely on them. And that's what makes things holy, is that Christ, God speaks his word and brings us into a communion of saints brings us all together because where God's word is spoken there also is Christ John 1 tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God that is anytime you see word of God you can put Jesus because he is the word of God made flesh and I promise you we even to this day make Jesus commonplace. We get used to him and we take him for granted. And if you would like an example, take out your dollar, look at it, and it says, in God we trust. We've made him ambiguous. We've, we've even made him asexual. We have completely made him ambigu ambiguous. We've gone too far. We no longer fear the Lord. We no longer tremble in the presence of Christ and His cross. And I can prove it to you by what you used to spend your dollars on. Truly where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is in the holy place of God, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is in your family, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is in your friends, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is in the baptismal font, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is Jesus Christ on the altar, there your heart will be also. And so understand, when we receive Christ, when we get up and we leave, and someone speaks to you about God, do not be ambiguous. Do not be flippant about Christ. Do not be flippant about God. Because many people say that uh, the military has fought and died for our right to be able to express God. And that's true. So you should respect it by being specific about the God you're talking about. Don't you think? Unless we take them for granted. And your freedoms for granted. Be specific. There is no God outside of Jesus Christ. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you want to honor the sacrifices of our veterans, confess it specifically. 
you have the freedom to do so. So let God be on your lips. Even when Moses said, well, God said to Moses, go to the Egyptians and tell them to let go of my people. And Moses says, okay, I can go and tell them that the God, that, that the God of my fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of, uh, of Isaac, the God of, uh, of our fathers, the God of Jacob, all said, that he said that you should let them go. What are they going to say? We have gods too. The Egyptians easily said they have lots of them. Tons of them. We have gods too. Who's this God? And who are those people? And why should I care? Be specific, Moses, or get going. And so and no, Moses noticed that. So he looks at God and he says, I, I need more specifics. I can't just go and say this and they'd be like, oh, okay, fine, you can take them. It's free labor. And so God said, tell them that I am who I am. If you look at that in Hebrew, it is Yahweh ben Yahweh. In other words, God gave his name to Moses. And Moses went. And when they asked, who has sent you? He gave them God's name. Yahweh has sent me. Yahweh says, let my people go. Yahweh says, and he speaks the name and the word of God. Now listen to this. This is very important. The same way that Moses had God's name given to him to deliver over to the Egyptians, so do you. You have the name of God as well on you in baptism. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And there, that name is placed upon you forever. Yahweh burned into your forehead with water and the Word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now wherever you go, you take that name with you. And so where you stand, that place is holy. Not for your own account, but because God's name is on you. You know what that's called? Being a Christian. Amen.